And here we go. Hello, hello, hello. I'm Dr. Stacy. Happy Juneteenth. <laughs> we be free, y'all. We be free. <laughs> So I'm going to give a couple folks a minute to just get into the to the um into the live cast, and then we will get going. So we got one person to the party. Two, yeah, we'll give folks a couple minutes to get in. This is always the moment that I'm not sure what to do. Like, should I sing "Fight the Power"? Fight the power! Yes, yes. Fight the power! Of that thing. Fight the Come power! On, of that thing. Or I'm proud to be black, y'all. And that's a oh, fact, y'all. And if you try to take what's mine, I take it back, back y'all. <laughs> it's like yes. that. What's you need the a theme. Around? You need a theme in the background. You need a theme song for yeah, your yeah, you know, I know. Break out. What's I mean, what's your favorite proud to be black song? Each of y'all. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, I gotta think about that. What about James Brown? I was yep. thinking, I was James thinking Brown. James Brown. Yeah, come on up. Well, it's interesting, Doc, that you mentioned those both of those two songs. Yes, I remember uh, being a part of Bam Black Action Movement Two at University of Michigan, right? And that was one of the theme songs. That Run DMC song was one of the song. theme songs that we played regularly. You know, yeah. yes. Yeah. I was a freshman in college in Twin Towers at Norfolk State. Behold the green and gold. And I love that Run DMC album. Licky, 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 licky. <laughs> so it's about five after five. I think that's a good time that we could just go ahead and get going. Y'all ready to get going? Sure enough. All right. So happy Juneteenth, everybody. Juneteenth is a celebration of when the last slaves were informed in Texas that. African Americans had been emancipated. We be free two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Black folks have had a tough 155 years since that time, but it hasn't been all bad. If I had to do it all over again, you know what I would choose? Black, definitely. Black excellence, black girl magic, black boy joy, the black church spade tournaments, knee bowing, dozens playing, mama song loving, who made the potato salad asking, uncle brother, aunt sister, baby boy, baby girl, HBCU grad, astronauts, holy ghost catching, soul line dancing, sister club, sister friends book clubbing, per color purple, movie quoting, Inventing, innovating, chipping the cookie, dot in white spaces. <laughs> yes, my name is Dr. Stacy, and I am the host of the Being the Dot broadcast, debuting July 5th on all platforms, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and of course, iTunes. And I am privileged tonight to come to you to celebrate Juneteenth and to celebrate being black and black, black, black. There is enough despair in the world today that we don't have to focus on that, that that is before us on an everyday, all day basis. But tonight I wanna focus on the joy, the blessing, the beauty of being black. And I have with me a few of my friends to talk about this. And so I'm just gonna go around the round table and have them introduce themselves. Why don't we start with Dr. Tanya and then we'll take it from there. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Tanya Ingram. I am originally from Alexandria, Virginia. I was born in Washington, D.C., and I am currently living in Houston, Texas, and I am excited to be here. Go ahead, Harp. Okay. Professor. Uh, Harvey Edwards, uh, as the shirt <laughs> says, straight out of Brooklyn. That's where I grew up. Um, yes attended uh, Bucknell University up the road and uh, currently work at Susquehanna University in the English and Creative Writing Department. And glad to be here. Welcome to all of you. And uh, let's get it on. Let's get it on. Let's get it on. That's another one, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Stacy. Thank you for, for having me. I represent 
uh, the lightly melanated part of the black experience, all right? Lightly melanated, right? Uh, uh, thank you so much. Dr. Stacy and I first met in Ann Arbor, Michigan, I, uh, or she was there. Uh, I attended University of Michigan, did not finish my degree, so I, I, I appreciate being in, in the smart, the intelligent company that I'm in today. Uh, grew up, really was born in, in Cleveland, Ohio, grew up all over the place, lived Washington, D.C., Cleveland, Ohio, all over the place when I was young. Uh, just lived a ra rather transient lifestyle when I was young, but I make my home. Uh, went to my high school in Detroit, Michigan, came up to Ann Arbor to go to school, and that's where, I, that's where I'm at now. Great. And I, I live in Seals Grove, Pennsylvania. I am a psychologist by training and a higher ed professional um, at Susquehanna University, Dean of Health and Wellness here and Director of the Counseling Center. I am also a professional speaker as well and a podcast producer. Who knew, Come right? <laughs> we knew. We knew. We knew. We knew. I get excited. <laughs> um, and in West Philadelphia, born and raised. Come on. The playground is where I spent well, all my days. Most of my most days. Of my days. Most on. of my the, days. The fresh princess. That's, That's right. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Please come see. So, <laughs> so we have about 16 people who are on, guys, and we got some comments as well. But I'm going to go ahead and ask. Um, somebody said, don't share too much, Dr. Stacy. So I'm going to go ahead and ask the first question, which was, when did you first realize that you were black? Mm. Or maybe the other question is, when did you first realize that other people were white? Mm. Why don't we start with you, Harvey? Um, so my mother was from Georgia and my father was from North Carolina. And we went back to Georgia just outside of Savannah for a family reunion. I was probably five or six years old and my cousin's dog bit me it was a you know a minor bite but it it needed some attention so i was taken to the hospital and had to enter through the back ha huh. and this would have been in the early 60s 62 something like that and um when I was brought in, all of the staff that were medical were white and the people cleaning and whatever were black. But one of the nurses, I assume she was a nurse, said, look at this black Yankee. Oh, this little black Yankee boy. Um, and um, that that is sort of been seared in my memory of um, that distinction, mm. you know, that 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 designation so that that was 1962 was the first consciousness of that nice <clears throat> what about for you dr tanya so um growing up in alexandria virginia because there is an alexandria louisiana i learned that upon arriving to uh houston <laughs> um i went to a uh, daycare at a catholic school and so, you know, in kind of thinking about this question, what I realized is that um, outside of that experience, my world was beautifully black, um, very affirming. And so for me, it was more of a, oh, they're not black. Like, maybe even that's unfortunate. I don't know. But, you know, they, it was just a wonderful, a black church, a black neighborhood. It was very affirming. Um, and so going to that school and kind of seeing some of the, the nuns and, and, and one of the little girls that, um, and, and so this was probably early 70s, um, that was my friend. And, and one day I just happened to notice that, wow, her skin is really, really light. And, you know, I'm on the, I'm representing the kind of the light, bright end of the diaspora uh, myself <laughs> with Brother Pete there. Um, so, you know, it's like, wow, you, you know, you look at me, what's going on? And so I think that was just kind of the realization that, oh, there are two colors. Um, one that's light and one that's even lighter. So I think that was my my realization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you, Brother Pete? 
so you know uh my realization came fairly hard similar to, to harvey i can remember being in the first grade right and there was this little young girl in the first grade and i guess we would nowadays we call her the fast tail girl right but she <laughs> said to me she said well we should be boyfriend and girlfriend so i'm like okay let's be boyfriend and girlfriend right yeah she would definitely so, be a fast tail little girl yes first grade, first grade so we walk around school that day holding hands and i remember this distinctively uh you know i'm i'm uh walking her outside the school and i stand along the the little curb where the parents would drive up to pick us up right uh -oh. and so she's caucasian you know i'm i'm lightly melanated but obviously uh, as dr stacy told me the world looks at you as black right uh and so i'm standing out there holding hands with her her parents roll up in a brown station wagon it, it sticks in my mind round state brown station wagon they stop mama looks out from the passenger side sees me and her little daughter holding hands she jump out the car grab her daughter put her daughter in the back of the car slam the door and they peel off I'm like, I mean, I'm like, later in life, I'm like, how could even a station wagon just like burn rubber peel off? Right? <laughs> they were gone. They were gone. And the next day, the next day she comes back and she says, you can't be my boyfriend anymore. So now my boyfriend is John. Now, I don't remember her name, but I remember his name because in my mind in first grade, John should be spelled J-O-N, but it was spelled J-O-H-N. So I was like, oh, John, your boyfriend? So I beat him up in the coat closet. I just beat him up. In the coat so that was my first experience with, uh, and, and, and maybe, I, maybe that's, I just thought of something. Maybe that's why I never dated outside my race since then. Since then. So, so Pete, I'm guessing that would be about the same time as mine, 60s? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. Well, mine would have been a little bit later, right? Or that would have been. I don't, how old are you when you're in the first grade? I have no idea. But it five, or been, six. Five, five or six. Five or six. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So five or six. So that would have been early seventies. That would have been early seventies. Okay. But yeah, that was. Uh, remember awesome. that boy's name? J O H N. Yeah. J because that's so distinctive. It's so wow. distinctive. It should be J O N. It be I love it. So, I don't know that I have a memory of people being black and people being white. Really, but what I one of my first memories, I'm probably going to get in trouble for telling the story. But uh, my grandmother was shopping at Belk, and if you know anything about southern stores, Belk would be the Macy's, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even a little bit um, higher than Macy's of the south. And she was looking at leather purses, and the white sales lady came over to her and greeted her, but then started following her as my grandmother was kind of inspecting these persons, maybe she was gonna purchase one, I don't know. So my grandmother got annoyed and she was a woman of great distinction, but she also had a fabulous sense of humor. So she let one loose hmm. right there in the store, a silent one, but deadly. <laughs> and it took away. And then she starts smelling the purses. These purses smell funny. <laughs> so but she left the store. My grandmother said she was way up the street. That lady was still smelling the purses. <laughs> so I think that's kind of my first memory of that there was something up in our relationships with white people but also it was my first lesson on how that you don't have to be um completely a victim to the situation that you can empower yourself in all the ways that you needed to do that that's good that's so good that's yeah good. that's good stuff i love that i love that <laughs> my have you ever told that story publicly before i don't think i have my aunties are going to kill me oh it's hilarious <laughs> though <laughs> sorry aunties <laughs> <laughs> out there in the Love internet now. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> you but can't put that genie back in the bag. Yeah, yeah a bill out. cannot be on wrong. <laughs> so, I guess I'm wondering, as you think about your own life and black excellence, what would be your your favorite moment? And maybe you don't have to just give one but your favorite moment of black excellence. So I, I, I get, well, I've got one. 
you know, I mentioned having bounced around and all over the different places when I was young. My mother actually struggled with mental illness, and that led us being transient and homeless. I've lived in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. Dr. Tanya mentioned that. Uh, one particular place, besides the, so besides that incident there early on, I really had no awareness of black consciousness, right? I wasn't settled for any particular length of time whereby I could really tune into black culture and all that because just, just, just a rough upbringing, right? But I can remember living in a group home here in Michigan, right? And I had a little, uh, a little white roommate. And I can remember going in a room and he's playing some kind of music. And that music was just amazing. I was like, who is that? Right? Because I just never heard it before. He points on the wall and says, that's him. Now, here's the quiz. That him was this brown boy with this glove on that sparkled, right? And he was doing this little move showing his socks and his socks were sparkling, right? So what? I can't hear you now. Come on now. That's ex- so I was, he was like, that's him. Now, mind you, to that point in my life, that was probably around eight or nine years old. I'd never heard of the Jackson 5. I'd never really heard their music, ABC. I hadn't heard any of that. But I knew when I walked in the room, I'm like, whatever that's playing is amazing. And this was a little white boy. He had the poster on the wall, right? He had the music playing. He introduced me to that. I was like, my goodness, that whatever that, whoever that, what's his name? You know, ask Michael Jackson. Never heard of him. But uh, and we all, of course, have a Michael Jackson, uh, Michael Jackson story. I'll piggyback on that one with this. I can remember being in Detroit. By now, I'm in, in high school. And uh, this was at a Kmart. We walk into a Kmart, and the music video industry had just started, right? It had just started. MTV had just launched. And there were these piles of TVs and, and some kind of recorders in the middle of Kmart, right? And they were, and I mean, there was piles of TVs, and people, it must have been 150 people were around these TVs, and they were watching this video, right? Anybody know what the first video on MTV was? Same person. Thriller. 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 Exactly right. We, everybody just like watching it because we had never seen anything like it. We'd never seen anything like it. So those two, the, the first experience with black culture, and then, as you mentioned, just tying that into black excellence, here in, in the Kmart on the east side of Detroit where people just all, all colors, because I grew up on the east side when we were, it, it was more diverse, you know, they're biracial and just everybody just watching it like, man, this right there, that brother, that's a bad brother. So that, that, those are the stories that come to mind for me. Awesome. Who wants to go next? Uh, I'll go. Um, I had the the good fortune of having a friend who um, worked for a local congressman and got um, tickets to the infamous purple section for Obama's first inauguration. So my, my son, I have twin sons and only one could go with me. I only had two tickets. So my son and I went down to Virginia, took a ferry into DC, and then found out how notorious the purple section was. People were stuck in um, a tunnel trying to get into the area to get in. But um, I said to my son, we're not getting in that, that madness there, we're going this way. So we went down under an overpass back up onto the other side, and we ended up getting in. Not only that, but there's um, a type of photography called Gigapan, where it shows the whole entire scene, but then you can zoom in and see individuals, Mm. like Clarence Thomas was sleeping, you know, in the photo that I saw. And my son and I were close enough that we can find ourselves in the photo. Nice. Wow. That's so awesome. That's that's black excellence. I'll point out to you today where we were at Obama's first inauguration. Oh, oh, man. That's powerful. That that was unbelievable. And and again, I'm just going to highlight that tens of thousands of people were stuck in the tunnel trying yes. to get there in the purple section. But we got in and witnessed the whole entire ceremony. It was it was phenomenal. Wow. Phenomenal. Okay. That's awesome. So for me, I think on two levels. So one at the local level, um, black excellence. 
I have to go with my mom, mm. Dolores Copeland. So she was a school teacher. And, um, you know, when you're a kid, you don't know that your school teachers even have a life outside of the school. I mean, I certainly thought they lived in the closet and they just came out every morning, taught us and went back in. Right. <laughs> so um, but she was a school teacher and she started out um, when the schools were segregated in Alexandria. So if you were an African-American child of a certain age, you probably went through one of two or three ladies uh, class and my mother was one of those women. And so um, as we would go to the grocery store or be in the mall or she was a rock star. And it was interesting because you know how we feel about our elementary school teachers. And so, you know, the, the guy is, you know, six, two and, you know, 200 pounds. And all of a sudden he's just on tiptoes screaming, Miss Edwards, Miss Edwards. Or Ms. Edwards. You know, and so, you know, how do I make sense of that at, you know, five, six, seven, eight? I'm like, my mother is famous. Right. Mommy, are you famous? Right. And, and certainly, I, are you famous? She's like, well, I'm a teacher, you know. But um, so just kind of seeing that. Um, you no, know, just gave me something to uh, aspire mm. to. And I don't know that I, I um, made that much sense of it, but it was like, whatever she does for people, I want to do something like that to have that kind of impact so that when I go to the grocery store, people will do a little dance for me. And, um, and it was interesting because depending, I could figure out when she taught you. Um, and at some point it translated over to the schools desegregated. And so then it would be little black children and white children and, you know, whatever. And so, uh, you know, some would call her Ms. Edwards and some would call her Ms. Copeland. So that was, you know, kind of depending upon when she actually taught them. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, kind of at that, um, a macro level is seeing um, candidate uh, Obama mm. come to um, uh, kind of an outdoor park in Manassas and just the appeal that he had. Mm. Um, I just screamed and yelled and so did everybody else around me. I, it's called a Nissan Pavilion now, but um, at the time, and at, at one point I screamed so hard that I gave myself a headache for a couple, like a little brain freeze. And I'm like, is this guy running for president or is he like a rock star? But yes, it was yes. just, yeah, it was both. And it was just something to see just kind of the diversity and how he came in and just took command of this outdoor arena um, as we sat, you know, some on blank it some in mud some you know some of us got there early enough to have a seat and so that was just a really a memorable experience wow so we had a comment thank you for that um dr tanya we had a comment from one of our viewers right now we have about 24 people on with us you guys it says um oh, yeah. when wally famous amos of the cookie fame flew in by my hel with flew in by helicopter to my elementary school and spoke to us during Black History Month back in the early 90s. You got to wow. love that. That's some Yay. black excellence, right? Other people yeah. go, go ahead and put your comments up about um in in the comment section on Facebook about other experiences of black excellence. I really want to hear what folks have to say. So, I would say um uh, I I think um one of my favorite moments was during orientation at Norfolk State University, which is my alma mater. And the Dean of Students name was Ruth Jarvis. And she was a force. Like she, I don't think this woman ever split a verb in her entire life. <laughs> and, um, and she was always beautifully coiffed and put together. Uh, in a way that um, was actually stunning. I see you nodded, Tanya. I don't know if this resonates for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and and sometimes when I'm doing public speaking, I will, I mean, her, she almost had like a British accent. You know how Madonna has that fake British accent? It was kind of like that at some level. <laughs> <laughs> That's fake. <No>. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and so so that was true for me. I also have a memory of my Aunt Dot's 40th birthday party. Um, and she had, and so for, for, for our listening audience, 
my aunt Dot worked in cosmetics uh, my entire life. And so uh, she worked in Bonwood Teller in Philadelphia, which was be probably the equivalent of Saks Fifth Avenue um, as the only black person for years and years and years. Um, but for her 40th birthday, she had a coming out party. I'd never even heard of a coming out party, but she had on this silk blue dress and everybody else was appropriately dressed as well, uh, complimentary dressed and there to celebrate her. And I so remember, uh, and I think that's where, um, um, all of you know, probably you may not know this about me, that I like to celebrate my birthday. I am <laughs> strongly committed to it. Last year, you missed the Beyonce karaoke party. Yeah. Right, but um, <clears throat> but I, I just remember the power of her lead of celebrating herself. And it wasn't a wedding. It was not connected to something with some man, but it was about her celebrating herself and um, that was very, very, very powerful to me. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That is awesome. No other comments uh, from, the, from the folks? <clears throat> so what, what, um, what's your favorite, your own memory of your own life when you think about Black excellence that, uh, that you'd like to share with our listeners? Well, I have one. I, I'll go with one. This is it's it's, it's kind of funny. It, it, it's black excellence, but it really speaks to uh, our, I, I guess, the the collective consciousness of being black, even in, in the oddest places. You know, Stacy and and uh, Dr. Tanya you know this. I was on this reality television show called The Biggest Loser, and uh, uh, there was a moment on this the, the, the television show, The Biggest Loser, where. I had the responsibility of, of dividing people up in teams, right? Oh. And I can remember thinking, here I am. I am. Uh, I'm lightly melanated. I, I've, I've not allowed my my personality to really to shine forth on the show because I didn't want to get voted off. In my mind, I'm like, I'm not gonna be the black guy that gets voted off. <laughs> I need to right. learn how to lose this weight. I'm going to figure this out, right? But we had a sister on the show. Her name was Shannon, and I can remember when I'm dividing the teams up. I'm like, well, I got to make sure that Shannon has a good teammate, right? Because I can't mess with a sister, right? I can't have nobody say, oh, she, he gave her that teammate, and now she got voted off the show, right? I you better not. You better not on national television. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, but, like, this was, it wasn't that kind of pressure, but in my mind, I got to take care of her, right? And so, I, mind you, I, pitted, I put her against a, a, a partner, a buddy. He gets voted off two weeks later. He calls me and he says, I said, what, you got voted off the show? He said, yeah, you put me on that team and I got voted off. I was thinking, oh, that's too bad. But at least my homegirl, she's still on the show. She's still there. We good. Still there. We good. We good. That's right. Now, here's the other piece of that. You know, when I was at home, I'm working out at home, I lose 83 pounds in 62 days while I'm on the show, another 102 pounds at home. This constant refrain, thank you, this constant refrain in my and mind kept, is... And, wait a minute, and kept it off. Right. Kept it off. Right. Yeah, kept it off. Yeah. <laughs> this, thank you. This constant refrain in my mind is, you are not going to go back. You represent more than yourself. Ain't nobody going to be like, you remember that fat joker? He went back on the show and didn't do nothing that whole summer, right? So I'm jogging around the track in my neighborhood with that refrain in my mind that you don't just represent yourself. You represent other people. Mm. Even though, it, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't really to that level. It wasn't literally, literally that anybody was looking at me and putting any kind of pressure to represent the race. But in my mind, it was just something. It was a, it was a great motivator. Of course, I go back and, had, and, and lost the most weight of all those that got voted off and won a couple dollars and all that kind of stuff. But I distinctly have those memories. Take it, take, look out for the sister, right, that was on the show, and then re represent yourself well. Uh, not just yourself, but represent your race well. I distinctly remember those things. That's beautiful. Snacks for that. Who wants to go next? Harvey, you want to go? Uh, sure. Uh, so, <laughs> so neither of my parents growing up in the South, Jim Crow, um, neither of them finished grade school. 
but they were part of the great migration. And so I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Um, my mother really valued education um, and she wanted me to get my education. She, she made sure of that. But I, you know, I went to school. I didn't cause any trouble or anything. I went to school, but I, I, I wasn't profoundly motivated. And then when I got to um, sixth grade, it turns out that I was reading at a fourth grade reading level. Mm. And so I had to go to summer school. So I went to summer school and the teacher, I, I, I wish I could remember her name because I owe her my career. Um, mm. She, um, we had this basal reading where you had to read the yellow, then the green, then the brown, then the blue, and you went all the way up to whatever color and then you were on your, your reading level. But she pulled me aside at one point. She said, listen, it doesn't matter what you read as long as you develop your fluency. And so I got into comic books, specifically Marvel comic books. So I read voraciously that summer. Um, in, in Brooklyn, you go junior high school, seven, eight, nine. So seventh grade comes along and I'm tested and my math is, you know, ninth grade level and my reading is 10th grade level. And so they give me the option of, of either going seventh, eighth and ninth grade or skipping eighth grade and going straight to ninth grade. And um, so I, I chose, no, I'm, I'm in no hurry. There's no rush. I'll go seven, eight, ninth grade. Um, when we finally get to ninth grade and it's award ceremony. And again, I wasn't, you know, the, the standout scholar student, but I did my work and everything else. So we're sitting in the assembly, all, all the kids, seventh, eighth and ninth graders and the ninth graders are getting the awards because they're graduating and everything else. And my friends and I, basketball players and what have you are laughing at people call, you know, look at that knucklehead. Yeah. That brainiac, that bookworm, whatever. We're, you know, just fooled around and all of a sudden, um, I hear my name call. Uh Oh, and, and my friends are like, what's with this? You know, <laughs> you're with us. Um, so my, my ninth grade year graduating from junior high school, I received the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Award for promoting peace in the school. Oh, yay. Yay. It came with a beautiful certificate. And um, I, I think back then it was like a hundred dollar savings bond. If you know what that is. <laughs> yes. Um, Cause they're practically gone. But, um, that was a turning point in my life that allowed me to see that I could do anything I put my mind to. Mm, that's beautiful. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. That is awesome. And now I'm an English teacher, ironically. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> Killing it. You know what it takes. Absolutely. Yes, you do. Dr. Tanya? So I think for me, um, being in high school and I decided that I would try out for the school play. Uh -uh. And um, it was interesting. I know you've never heard this story. And, How is that? Um, I talk to you twice a day and I don't know the story. I know, for decades. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, and so, you know, kind of uh, happy, sad or whatever. But I went out. I just decided that it's my first play. Let's just go all out. So I decided to try out for the lead part. I did not get it. Okay. However, this is this is bad. What the what the drama teacher said was that, and she was a little young white young lady, that she has been in the drama department since, you know, ninth grade year. She's a senior. We really want her to have this part, blah, 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 blah. Um, but you were really good. And, you know, you are more than welcome to, you know, kind of do understudy and this other part. And, you know, if something happens and she can't go, then you'll go and yada, yada, yada. Um, and Black Excellence said, OK, because at some point, you know, you can't always take your marbles and go home. Right. 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 And so I 
you know, kind of came home, told my mom what happened. And she's like, you want to do this? We're going to stick it out. You know, the black mama, you're not quitting. Get back on there and do what you're supposed to do. Um, and so that's what I did. And when it was time for my second best part uh, to come out on the stage, um, I nailed it. And just to hear my peers kind of screaming and clapping and cheering, because I went and told them what happened. But, you know, we just we, we made the best of that. And um, and they were they were proud of me. I was proud of me because I didn't quit. I hung on in there, showed my my chops. Um, and and there you go. And so I think, you know, for for me, it just kind of taught me this this uh idea that you know you got to keep going like you, you mm -hmm. gotta you gotta keep going i think fast forward many years later i think the the big excellence um a black excellence piece for me was earning the doctorate and oh, being able right. to have my mother standing there by me um you know many 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 years later just to kind of see that you know i just saw a meme not too long ago that girls who get talks too much in class grow up to be uh fearful women fierce women you know and it's like yes all of that all those times you wanted to put me on punishment i told you i was talking about something important in fifth grade so uh <laughs> it was important mama but you know just to kind of have that she was an educator and to have that come um full circle um, was just really a very proud moment because it was it it, it took a village and I was so thankful um, that the Lord allowed her to be able to witness that that moment in my life. So we got a got a comment. Thank you, Dr. Tanya. We got a comment from one of our listeners. He says, or she, I'm not sure. Applying for business school, I had no money to pay for anybody's school. Upon asking admission staff how I could get to attend their school for free, they laughed and told me I would need to get a 700 on the GMAT. And I said, okay, went and studied for a month and took uh, took the test and I got a 720 in the ninth percentile. Yes. And came back to them with a smile like, cha-ching, go, go, do it, do it, do it. I, do I it. like the cha-ching. Cha-ching. <laughs> Keep sharing those stories. We love. He said 94th percentile. Keep sharing those stories. We really love those. Yep. Yeah. So um, I would say um, my favorite moment was um, so I uh, went to left Norfolk State and I went straight to graduate school, grabbed a master's and moved towards a PhD as a very young woman. And it was difficult. It was trying. It was Tanya's nodding, lots of tears and uh, fake heart attacks and just, I mean, just, it was, it took me seven years to complete my PhD. In the middle of that, I was tested for a learning disability. I found out that I was dyslexic, that I have a reading disorder, that, um, and that the, the psychologist who, when he was presenting me the results, he's like, have you taken statistics? I was like, yeah, like six times. He's like, and you passed? Well, yeah. And so part of it was I had to work harder, but I never thought anything about it because we were taught that we would have to do work three times as much to get half as far, right? And so I never thought that something was off and nobody ever quite paid attention that I couldn't sit in my seat in school or that I talked too much, the nuns would call, I would get a beaten, I would act right, and then we would start to circle all over again, right? <laughs> and so <sighs> and so it was it was probably one of the most difficult things in my life. And all my friends and my cohort had gone off and I would go to graduation and sit in graduation just to keep my eye on the prize. And so three times a year I just went and I sat in the audience. And uh, I'm about to cry, but but I finished, and it was my graduation Amen. day. Yes. Amen. And honey, what do they call the people who are trying to make you act right during the graduation? What are they called? Like the they're not ushers. Oh, it's not the no, no. Huh? Um, I know you. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's the people who are there to keep the order in the graduation. Marshals. Thank you. They could not contain me. I was uncontainable. 
I was yell. It was like we was in church. <laughs> we oh. were. <laughs> we were in church, and my advisor looked at me and she said, "You know what? You do." all that you need to do. I mean, I, I, I mean, I could just tell you, so I failed comps twice. I mean, it was a mess, lost me. It, I, it was just, if, if you could think of a messy doctoral process, that was mine. And I walked across the stage clapping, waving, kissing at my family and friends. Still and you know, it's your birthday. Right, it was my birthday <laughs> at the <laughs> Pennsylvania State University. And you know, my family would appropriately responded in kind because we certainly come from a call and response tradition. And so they were all in. Um, and basically I held up the graduation. Um, just for my moment, <laughs> just my moment. And like, I work hard for this. I'm gonna have to pay for it eventually. Like, <laughs> whatever. Like, I'm just gonna have my moment. But um, you know, the empathy that that struggle gives you to work with students come on. is invaluable. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Because you, you, can, you can understand the struggles that students are going through firsthand. Well, and, and, and in that moment, I felt like I was a cute. All my little cousins was there, my nieces, my goddaughter, uh, along with my, my, the committee, my aunties and mom and some cousins. I mean, it was like we were posseed up. Yes. And I felt like I was breaking through something generationally for my family. And that while I was first generation for an advanced degree, that the struggle that I had would not be the same for those that came behind me because of the lessons that I learned. And that to me is my single favorite moment of uh, Black Excellence. There you go. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. So Pete wrote, you want to share this about your uncle Otis? Sure. This is, this is you asked us about really the, uh, our favorite moments of, of Black Excellence and others. And so this was this, uh, again, after, after I got settled from bouncing all around the country, I had some third cousins adopted me and I began to to learn about family members, different people that were in my family. And one of the folks that was in my family uh, uh, was my uncle Otis Smith. And so my uncle Otis Smith, he actually was a, uh, just was, was, I didn't know he was so successful. He appeared in, in Jet almost every single year. Wow. He was uh, the state. He was the first judge uh, on the Michigan Supreme Court uh, back in, uh, in October of 1961. He served as a justice on that Supreme Court. Uh, he, he received his undergraduate from Frist University, and he was a member of the Uni University of Michigan Board of Regents. He was the, the highest ranking, became the highest ranking black man in corporate America uh, when he was appointed general counsel for general. Motors. Now, here's a wow. funny story. My, wow. my, my third cousins adopted me. I'm living on the east side of Detroit, and they said, we want you to meet your, a couple of your uncles are coming to town, right? They're going to, they, they live right outside of these Detroit in the suburbs, and they're coming to town because I had I was graduated from high school. And they wanted to talk to me about the next steps and the things that I needed to do. So I'm like, okay, I will, you know, if they're coming to, coming to see me, I, I'm, I'm there. And so I can remember standing out on the porch looking, and then I see this big old ugly Buick driving down the street. Now, mind you, you know, you're from the hood. So when I'm from the hood, you know, if it's not flashy, it, it don't mean anything, right? So I see this ugly Buick park on my block. I see these two tall, light-skinned guys, right? Because we was all light-skinned is, is in the family. They about 6'5", as well, 6'4". And then one of them, actually, I noticed he has this brown jacket on with these, like, you know, leather patches on the elbow. And I'm thinking to myself, that's the ugliest ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. What is that? What? I didn't know later that that's like a $400 Brooks Brothers uh, Brooks Brothers jacket. I didn't know that, right? So they came and sat down with me and talked about the next steps in my education and my Uncle Otis ended up paying for my first year at Wayne State. And I still had no real consciousness of his successes, the things that he had accomplished in his life until he passed away in 94. And that's when I found out all of these different things that he had done. And, and, and he wrote a book and I'm reading about, you know, his work in the civil rights movement and all of these, mm -hmm. these different things. And he really became an icon to me later in life, right? Later in life. Uh, but that was just, that touched me. And, and I mentioned this other story as well. I had my Aunt Lois who passed away about five or six years ago. 
she there was these group of black women in Los Angeles, right? And they decided that they, they needed to work to make systemic change, right? One of them, I, I don't know the name of one of them, but there were these other two women that you should recognize. Diane Watson, she goes on to serve in the House of Representatives for about 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. Maxine Waters was one of them, right? My aunt Lois Hill Hale was one of them. And this other lady, they, were, they, were, they called themselves the four, all right, so there were four women who decided we're going to start running for politics, for political offices at the local level and move our way up. And when one of us get a leg up, the other will support. OK, so my aunt Lois, for instance, was 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 president of the school board in Inglewood, California. She had started this newspaper there, a black owned newspaper and interviewed just tons and tons of stars. Right. Uh, but Diane Watson she began to move a little quicker. So she began to, to get up and she was elected to the to the state house there in Los Angeles. So my aunt moved to serve her and served her as press secretary for her entire career. We're talking wow. about serving for about 25, 30 years, right? Wow. And at the same time, Maxine Waters is on this track and all of that. So these women, the, this is just another example of black excellence. These women partnering up together, setting their minds, saying we're going to achieve something. Whoever gets there first, the other is going to help out. The other is going, right. to, going to serve. The other, That's beautiful. It, it, it is just an amazing, amazing testament uh, of black excellence, you know, uh, not just in our family, but in our culture. You bet. You bet. So Charmaine Lee says just being black in a black awesome family is one of her favorite things. Amen to that. Nah. Yep. Yeah. So, and people are commenting about how inspiring the stories are, folks, just so you know. Beautiful. Beautiful. <clears throat> so, what's your favorite part of the culture? What's the part of our culture that you enjoy the most? Um, I, I am going to say the global impact of black culture in the world mm. in every realm music dance fashion sports mm. language food on and on and on and we know that it gets appropriated and twisted and turned and borrowed and stolen and everything else but we know where the roots come from and 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 our contributions are are limitless are limitless so you know everywhere everywhere and just about everything nice Kedon wilson says black women and charmaine lee says talking and sharing stories keep those comments coming folks so i think for me um the part of the culture i enjoy the most um i'm gonna say um black faith Mm. And so, um, that's good. You know, that's I good, spent, Tanya. <laughs> so you know, I spent twenty-five or so years in higher education, but as I did that, I always had this kind of parallel um, career in church, and so you know, kind of from a small child carrying my Aunt Vivian's music case because she was a church organist to, you know, work in VBS to work in the repass. And you know how you fold a little um, napkin up with the, with the fork and the knife, get the, yeah, gotta get that right. And so um, with all of that, always serving in some role or a capacity in church. And so I, in 2018 had a career shift, my, my dream to come on and work at a church full time. And so here in Houston, um, I'm the director for Christian education at New Faith Church. And um, just what faith means, um, you know, when I say I love church, I mean, I love the, the choir, I love the praise team, I love the repast, I love when we shout, I love when the people swing their wig too hard, it falls off, I love the deacons, I love the deaconess, I mean, and you know, and, and what I'm realizing, um, because not that I... Um, don't have enough uh, degrees, but I'm working on a, um, a master's in theological studies. And so, you know, this idea of black theology that kind of comes out of a slave theology that says that God is on the side of the oppressed, that 
um, wealth and riches don't necessarily, um, that's not what God is looking for, but he cares just as much about, you know, the oppressed and the marginalized as he does the rich and the wealthy. And so this idea that we took this, this faith that some might say, why would you take on your oppressor's faith? But something in the spirit of that African that came to that was taken and brought to the Americas understood more about God um, and the sanctity of life and how he is sovereign. And so, you know, I appreciate, you know, our faith life and then how that is expressed. And I know that, you know, many people uh, attend multicultural churches or there are many African Americans that attend white churches and, I, and I'm not knocking any of that but certainly um, I just so appreciate the black church uh, uh, black theology that organ like um, some hymns like you know uh, you know you need some sweet eye prayer before you go back out into that world on Sunday afternoons and so I think that that is um, one of the things that I enjoy the most and what it has meant to me it was the place where I, I got to be in another play, um, where I sang my first solo, where, you know, uh, just just all of the, of, of what it meant um, um, to, to be at, at got church. Got fed in college. Faith. Huh? I said, was fed in college. I was fed in college. Thank you, and uh, thank, you, Pat, thank you, Dr. Guns. And so, you know, my internship, just all of what it means and what it still continues to mean for my children that, you know, my daughter's Girl Scout is attached, troop is attached to the church and my son is in the Boys' Rites of Passage attached to the church. And so um, I just so appreciate, um, appreciate that. I love it. I love it. That's beautiful. I, I preach, girl. That. Amen. Amen. I'll chime in on this. I want to piggyback on uh, what Brother Harvey said. Love Dr. Tanya's comments. That's, that's just the faith has been such an integral part of my life. The black church has been it for me as well. Uh, so I appreciate both of those. I, I, I want to say for me, the thing that I love about our black culture is what, what I, would, I, mean, I would broadly call it black excellence. Like one of my brothers is, is a part of this. He happens to be commenting there on Facebook, Brother Kedon Wilson. I am a part of something called The Bar. It stands for Brothers Also Read. It's not just a book club. It is a literary group. And if you can imagine this, about every two months, uh, somewhere between 25 and 40 men get in, a, get in a room together, and we're talking about the book assignment for that particular period. Now, you know, it takes us two months to read through the book. Not saying that brothers are slow at reading and nothing like that. But it takes us two months to read through the book. But you've got to see there, there are 30 brothers at least in the room, and we talk about the book of, of that uh, for that assignment for four hours, for four hours. You know, no sports, nobody's talking sport, no cussing, no hip-hop, none of that. You know what I mean? We're talking about intellectual matters for nice. four hours, and it, yeah. is just, it is just powerful. So that's an example of black excellence. The other one, I want to piggyback on what? Uh, Harvey said, "This our culture." I was reading a book recently by uh, a guy named Ben, uh, uh, ben Horowitz. He's a Silicon Valley uh, uh, entrepreneur, Silicon Valley investment. He runs this investment house, and this is what he said. He started a what he called a cultural leadership fund, and he said, "This is what he said." A white guy says, "He said it's actually a bet on black exceptionalism." And I'm just going to read a couple of his quotes. He says. He said, what I mean by that is, is us, he means white folks, his, his investment house, recognizing that in the last hundred years, every new musical art form from jazz to blues to rock and roll to hip hop was invented by the same group, African Americans. Yeah. Yeah. Now, he, this, again, quoting him, almost all new fashion ideas were created by African Americans. Lately, almost all of the new visual artists, African Americans. What does that mean? It means that you have a group that's genius at moving customer behavior. So what he did was like that. He said they started to partner with the best leaders, people like Quincy Jones, Sean Combs, etc. He said where they would invest in our cultural leadership fund, and we could connect them to other entrepreneurs. He said so it becomes a bet on talent. And, and, and to me, this is the thing that, that I love about our culture that Harvey mentioned, 
not only do we swing over here, I mean, we got two PhD sisters on the phone, right? Not only do we swing over there, but we can swing over to, to, to moving uh, uh, customer behavior. Mentioned my own uncle, uncle, who was in the, in, in, the uh, in corporate America. We're just so diverse and so excellent that uh, uh, that's the thing that I love. And shout out to Dr. Stacy for just taking this, this time here to highlight that about us, you know? Sure. So we got a couple comments says um, uh, on a serious note, Kidon, the per perseverance that we've demonstrated over time, given structured pitfalls continues to be amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle Hunt That's Bruner good. says, what an awesome way to celebrate Juneteenth and black excellence. Thank you. So I would say um, how we do family and that we, that first of all there's your real family right and then there's all the fictive kin yes. that's my fancy phd word are your play cousin them that <laughs> um and that that it's all encompassing and that we are for each other there is nothing that i love more and and whether this is with my blood family or my um or my fictive kin or my family of creation that you're in a house, right? And there are multiple people, there's some people in all the rooms and there are <laughs> multiple conversations happening. Somebody's playing spades, somebody else is, the kids are in the corner on the internet or they may be having a dancing contest for the adults, right? Well, hustle, yeah. Right? Or, or and, and, and all the conversations are loud, right? So, oh, yeah. Right? And, it may even be spirited or robust, uh, depending on what you're talking about. We arguing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we fighting. Arguing. We arguing. Arguing. <laughs> um, and even the ability for people to be in the bicultural shift. And so for, for you to be able to be comfortable in that world, but also comfortable in the space that may be more of a white space. And that the fact that we're able to hold that and do that by cultural shift. And because when I go to a work party, it's, it's not loud like that. Unless it's a work party of people of color and then it's just like that. <laughs> um, but I, I just appreciate how we do family that it's not about you and your box and your nuclear family, but it's about when I think about my nuclear family, I really am thinking about my mother, her siblings, and their descendants. That's who I see as her nuclear, as my nuclear family versus me, my mom, my brother, and my stepdad. And so, um, and so I, I just love that. I enjoy that. I have personally been buoyed by that and sponsored by them. And, um, and, and I tried to do the same. I recently had a niece who uh, lived with us and that's part, that's how we do family. And, um, and I do think that that is part of how we have survived and thrived yeah. in this white space known as America. So go ahead. I was going to say, I think that's beautiful. It's interesting because as um, Harvey came on to the call, um, he's Edwards. And so I immediately went in. Where are you Edwards from? I think we're cousins. Uh, Claim me as family. And I'm, I'm, I was I'm like, well, you're cousins. Claimed. We're good. So, <laughs> yep, I think that is. And, and that one, is. Of the neat, one of the neat things about the Pearsons as well is the Pearsons have a, an organized family reunion that we give out scholarships yeah. and that they're officers and do's and 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 that so we are taking the power of family and using it to educate our children uh as well which is fantastic and so i love the word that pete used and, and that's genius um mm -hmm. that you know this idea of taking lemons and making lemonade that we have made our created our own structures created our mm -hmm. own ways to support ourselves and so right. you know absolutely as you know i think about on my way to norfolk state and and all the five dollars that that 
add it up to a thousand dollars to pay right. the tuition because that's how long ago it was that I was there. But shake, you know, a, shake a little money in their hand. Right, uh -huh. right. And, and so, that? you know, that <laughs> is just so, so important. Don't give out no dry cards, right? Put something in that card, uh, you know, don't give out a dry card. Yes, yeah, a little money. I've never heard that before. But so, okay. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Don't give yeah, dry either. cards. <laughs> but, I, but I understand what it means. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I just think that that, that right on with, with, with that, what you're saying there. So we are actually out of time. An hour went quickly. And oh. um, I know, I know. Uh, but I just wanted to give folks the opportunity to have any uh, closing brief words uh, that they wanted to say about Black excellence, about Juneteenth, or whatever. Well, I will, I will start off and get it out the way to let the, let the smarter folks go next. I just think, uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Stacy, so thank much you. for having us. Uh, this was just, this was a, an awesome moment just to reflect, right? Uh, and I think that uh, in the national environment, in, in these times of, of contention and, and contentiousness, if we can uh, take more moments like this, not just to reflect on, on black culture and black excellence as a whole and globally, but to even remember to, as, as some of your questions, I'm going to read those questions off so that other people may be able to use them, you know, on their own. How old were you when you realized you were black or what was your first black experience? You know, what was your favorite moment of your own black excellence, favorite moment of black excellence in others? Uh, and what about the culture do you enjoy most? That That's the, one of the, the things that you mentioned. You know, I heard somebody said it's not what you learn, it's what you reflect on and apply, right? Mm -hmm. So this time of reflection where you're able to reflect on, you know, the things that, that, that helped us to get over, the things that we find are unique in our own culture, those are the things that have gotten us through in the past, you know, those stories about our, our greatness within our family and the those are the things that are always going to, to, to get us through. So I, I just thank you, Dr. Stacy, for for, for uh, calling us together and making us reminisce on this. Uh, and I appreciate being here. Oh, thank you, Brother Pete, for being here. Yes. So thank you, Dr. Stacy. This was a wonderful way to spend my hour with my two uh, brother cousins, uh, uh, Pete and Harvey. God bless yeah. you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, one of the questions you asked us was um, if we were given the choice to be black, um, would we do it again and, and why? And absolutely, um, you know, it, it's kind of comes out of that, that national black anthem, um, even with the struggle and the, and the tears and, and the challenges, um, I just feel nothing but pride and gratitude um, mm -hmm. for the heritage, for the um, shoulders of my ancestors that I stand on, you know, even, you know, as I look at my, my, my shirt here, I think about HBCUs, the Black church, just all of it. Um, I just feel nothing but, but pride and, and gratitude. And I think that that's a journey. Um, you know, so much of our history is often hidden hidden um, or, you know, for me as a child trying to make sense of slavery, you know, at one point I got to this place of what did we do wrong um, mm -hmm. and then kind of coming full circle to, to realize nothing, that it was nothing but genius and God that that kept us and got us here. So, um, so you know, I just appreciate this opportunity and I'm so thankful, even though amongst all of the angst and the conflict that is happening in the country, um, it was a day of reckoning that had to come and I believe that the nation will be better for it as um, we as black people continue to speak up, um, to share our faith, to share our perspective, um, to, to advocate for ourselves um, and, and just to have um, sacred times like this where we can celebrate um, all of our triumphs. Nice. Dr. Brother Stephen, Harvey, yes. thank you for inviting me to this wonderful experience. I got to meet my cousin, Dr. Tanya, <laughs> and my brother, Pete, my new Honor. brother, man, Pete. Honor. This expands the, the, the circle of love. Um, to piggyback on Dr. Tanya's words, um, I teach a book by Bell Hooks called um, Teaching Community, The Pedagogy of Hope. 
And in oh. that book, she actually does this exercise or did these exercises when she taught where she would ask her students if they died and could come back, what would they come back as? White male, black male, white woman, black woman, and almost to a student, many of them realizing the privilege that white skin has, mm -hmm. many of them would say white. I would never say that because my life has been so blessed. Uh, we talked about the black excellence and our impact on every facet of life, every facet of life. You know, you think about the fact that people eat ribs today. That was the only thing left for our people to eat mm, after the people butchered. And we made it so wonderful that now it's a whole thing. Mm -hmm. we can make magic out of anything. Sure. We can make magic out of anything. So um, our heritage, we have to keep enlightening people. We have to keep sharing it. And there's no better celebration to do that than this moment right now. So Beautiful. thanks for having this. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. So I just want to um, just um, say thank you so much for taking the time to do this on a five o'clock on a Friday or four o'clock on a Friday in some cases that it's really been an honor to be able to hold this space with all of you and hear your stories. I'm so inspired and I'm so grateful for all of the people who uh, hung with us for the hour. Uh, we ended up in somewhere around 27 at the most people came and went, but I know that people will also see this um, as things, uh, as time marches on because this will be saved on Facebook. And so we appreciate them as well. I wanna remind you that I'm Dr. Stacy, that I'm the host of the Being the Dot podcast that will debut on July 5th on all platforms. It's more than a podcast, folks. It's a movement. Make sure you stay tuned. Like the pages, all social media, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok. <laughs> all of it. Just all, all of, of them. them. All of them. All of them. And stay tuned for more events like this where we have an opportunity to celebrate Black excellence, talk about being the dot in white spaces and have, help us all to not just survive, but thrive. See you later. All right. Good night. Right. Thanks, guys. Good night. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. You guys are amazing. In podcast.